uh, welcome everybody to this very special evening. It's uh, really with a great honor and pleasure this evening for the Pitt Family Foundation uh, speaker series for the U of A Law School, the University School of Government and Public Policy, and the Journalism School to welcome Dr. Jill Lepore. Uh, Dr. Lepore has been recognized really in all three of these disciplines uh, as an important 21st century commentator and scholar among her, among her books, which I'm sure many of you know, are These Truths, The History of the United States, This America, The Case for a Nation, If Then, How the Simulactics Corporation Invented the Future, and among others, The Secret History of Wonder Woman. I recommend all those books to you. They're very, very good. But if you haven't read her books, I'm sure you've seen her articles in the New Yorker or the New York Times or the Times Literary Supplement. Uh, she's been awarded the Bancroft Prize, the Ralph Waldo, Ralph Waldo Emerson Award, the American History Book Prize, and she's the president of the Society of American Historians. Uh, the reason we wanted Dr. Lepore this evening is that throughout her recent work, she has been concerned with the increasing polarization in our country and whether and how it can be reduced. Uh, her contribution in the field really is in the fact that her work gathers historical evidence that allows others, uh, political scientists and those who are in the field, to study and analyze political processes and behaviors. Um, Dr. Lepore is currently the Kemper Professor of History at Harvard and an affiliate professor of law at Harvard. Uh, before I uh, introduce her, uh, let, if you have questions and Dr. Lepore is looking for a very interactive session, uh, you can put them in the Q&A and we will receive them after uh, Dr. Lepore speaks for uh, um, as long as she's going to speak and uh, we'll have that robust conversation. So we're pleased to give you tonight for what should be a really wonderful evening and stimulating evening, Dr. Jill Lepore. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining this evening. It's really an honor to be here, and thanks for the lovely introduction. I've been asked to speak a little bit about the nature of political polarization in the United States, and I want to do that. And I also I want to show a few slides to talk about a project that I've been working on that is my most recent attempt to think about possible ways forward from what is, uh, I think, a, a fairly intractable problem it accounts for many of the ills and dysfunctions within our political system and broadly in our civic culture as well. So if I might, I'm going to um, share my screen here. So one of the things I've been really interested in is the consequence for our, uh, the accountability of the Constitution to the people of a polarized political environment. So I've become really interested in the question of the amendability of the constitution. The framers of the constitution set a very high bar for amending the constitution, but they didn't expect it to be impossible to do. They expected in fact to be done quite frequently. And the way that they talked about amendment, which was considered to be the triumph of the constitutional convention, um, was that it would not only correct problems that, it, that might well have been unanticipated in Philadelphia in 1787, but that amending the constitution would in fact improve it. The way that when you make an amendment um, to anything that you write, I mean, they considered amendment something a little bit more colloquially the way we might think about revision. And generally when you're writing something the, the more you revise it, the better it's getting. There always comes a point, I will say as a writer, when you know you've gone too far with your revisions and you're actually making your writing worse again. Um, so a trick in writing is to figure out where that point is. Um, but we have in the United States a constitution that has become effectively unamendable, something that was never intended and is a problem because as the framers understood it, the reason to have a strong amendment provision was to avoid the necessity of insurrection. They believed that if, if you couldn't change the constitution by amendment, the only way to make a dramatic change to the political order would be to wage an insurrection. And they wanted to avoid insurrection. What they did not anticipate was judicial review, which is what we got instead. 
um, we, in which the only way to really change the constitution is to reinterpret it. But the only people who can reinterpret the constitution are the nine people who sit on the Supreme Court. It wasn't always nine, but at the moment it is nine. Um, the Supreme Court is the least democratic branch of government. It's not, it's supposed to be even answerable to public opinion. Um, so we are now left in a situation in which the only form of constitutional change is going to the Supreme Court for a new interpretation of the constitution or waging an insurrection. Um, so unsurprisingly, we live at a time when Supreme Court nominations are exceedingly fraught um, because they are of significant moment to the, uh, the consequence of those nominations is in fact considerable because there is no other way to change the constitution. So I wanna talk a little bit tonight before opening up to questions. And one of the things I wanna ask you all to think about, and I'd love for people to begin putting these suggestions in the, in the Q and A right now. Um, if, if amending the constitution were politically possible, you'd still need a lot of support to do it. What amendment would you want to make to the Constitution for the to the to the U.S. Constitution? So we can maybe have a discussion about some of those suggestions when, when we get to the Q and A. Um, so what I want to do now, though, is talk a little bit about the relationship between political polarization and the unamendability of the Constitution. Uh, why did I somehow come out of this? Um, okay. I see. Okay. So what we're looking at here is um, a, a chart that you might be familiar with. Uh, this is a, on, on the x-axis here, we're looking at American history from the Civil War almost down to the present. And we're looking at two different trend lines that are plotted by quantitative data that political scientists and econ economists use. Um, we're looking here um, at party polarization in the House and in the Senate um, since the time of the Civil War. So remember, partisanship is just a difference of opinion between the two parties. Party polarization is when the parties move to the poles uh, of the political spectrum. So you know, from the equator, <laughs> from say, if you're thinking about the globe, either side of the equator, all the way to the north and the south pole, right? So it's it's the ideological polarization of the parties that's that's difficult. Par partisanship is not actually a political problem, or hasn't not historically been a political problem in the United States, but polarization is. So what we're looking at here are rates of polarization, looking at the left part of the chart, um, right after the Civil War, unsurprisingly quite high. Um, political polarization in Congress, uh, in both, both um, houses of the legislature, uh, declines through um, the Depression and the New Deal, um, through the period that leads from the New Deal to the Lyndon Johnson's Great Society um, in, in the late 1960s. And then and it is since this inflection point around 1970 or so, that polarization has been rising and rising steadily, unabatedly. Um, it's risen quite a bit since, since the date of this chart. The other thing we can look at, this is a chart we're looking now here at a slightly compressed view, and we're looking at slightly different figures. This is sort of from the post-war moment down to the present, where again, looking at the post-war moment, you see political polarization is quite low. Political polarization here um, is the red line. It's quite low to about you know 1970 or so, and then it begins to rise. But also um, on this chart uh, is, a, is a measure of income inequality that's called the Gini index. Um, and income inequality was relatively low. That is, most people were, uh, uh, the, the distance between the wealthiest people and the poorest people was not that great. And there's a huge clustering of people in a middle class. So when you're looking at this, this income inequality measure, the Gini index, which is in blue, all through the immediate post-war decades, it's extremely low. What you're seeing here are the consequences, for instance, of the GI Bill, uh, which spread um, prosperity and rose the standard of living across, certainly across um, uh, white veterans of the Second World War. Um, the provisions of the GI Bill were generally denied to black veterans. Um, but we're looking at the emergence of a white ethnic middle class here. My own father went to college on the GI Bill, was a poor Italian immigrant, uh, emerged <laughs> as a college graduate and a homeowner. Um, by 1956 due to the provisions of the GI Bill created essentially a functional social welfare state for veterans of that war. Um, by the time you get to uh, the end of the Great Society, the Lyndon B. Johnson program, uh, which was abandoned during the Vietnam War, income inequality begins to rise. So the thing to notice here, <laughs> the main takeaway of this chart, I promise there's not gonna be that many more charts, is that um, there's an incredibly close correlation between polarization and income inequality. The greater the distance between the rich and the poor, 
the greater the distance between the two parties. Um, so historians and political scientists have a lot of questions about this relationship. Like, is there some third force that's driving both of these changes that we don't see here on this chart? What are we supposed to be doing with this? And then what are the consequences for living together as a polity um, when people are so polarized politically and when the income in, in inequality is, is so high, um, as high as it's ever been in American history? So I got to be, I got really interested in knowing how these trends tracked against attempts to amend the constitution. So here's a chart um, that based on some of my research, um, there have been 12,000 proposals to amend the constitution introduced on the floor of Congress since the start of the, uh, of the country. Only 27 of them been only, have ever been ratified and only a handful more have gone to the states and failed ratification that would include um, the abolition of child labor amendment, uh, which never was ratified, and the equal rights amendment for gender equality, which was never ratified. Um, so there's 12,000 of these things that have never even gone to, you know, to states for ratification. It's a huge body of evidence. So you can detect patterns there. So here, what we're looking at um, from uh, the beginning of the century, from 1900 to the present, um, the same two things we looked at last time, uh, congressional polarization, um, here in this kind of aqua blue um, and polar and um, no, I'm sorry, polarization is in uh, red and income um, inequality is in this aqua blue and the bar charts at the bottom are the number of proposals to amend the constitution that were raised and introduced on the floor of Congress. Um, so I think you obviously immediately detect that the more polarized the country is, the fewer efforts people even make to try to amend the constitution. Um, unsurprising, right? If you just think about it for a minute, why bother trying to get a constitutional amendment passed and ratified in a polarized, like you can't even get legislation passed in a polarized polity. Um, but in other words, but it's useful to look at to consider one more consequence of polarization or of income inequality. We don't know what the relationship is between these two things. Is this dysfunction where the constitution has become effectively unamendable? The constitution was amendable until about 1975. Um, the Equal Rights Act was the last sort of really serious innovation constitutionally to be proposed, and it was it, it, its ratification period expired in in 1982, although that is a co contested fact today. So one of the things I wanna talk about is, you know, what does it mean that we cannot even imagine now making life better by amending the constitution? So my, this, this question has driven me to attempt a project to sort of rekindle Americans' constitutional imagination to say, I think we should imagine what it would mean to revise the constitution, admittedly. <laughs> It's a big hurdle, but I think there's a lot to begin for civic culture in having the conversation and thinking about if we were starting again, what would you do? Uh, what would you want to see in that constitution? States revise their constitutions all the time. They amend their constitutions all the time. States adopt entirely new constitutions all the time. Other countries amend the con their constitutions all the time. The U.S. has the most difficult constitution in the world to amend, not by its requirements, but in fact. In, in terms of the constitutional amendment rate in the United States. So the project that I've been working on is, uh, is a sort of massive data project, which is to analyze these proposals that made it to the floor of Congress, and then to add to that body of evidence proposals that were made by people who were not enfranchised or were who were poorly enfranchised and whose political preferences would not have found expression on the floor of Congress, but who nevertheless have agitated for constitutional amendments in order to sort of constitutionalize a broader democratic polity as we think historically. Um, and again, part of the spirit in which I'm undertaking this work is trying to restore the sense of possibility and the urgency and necessity of revisiting the constitutional order in a fairly regular way in order to, to live among people in changing circumstances. Um, one uh, just sort of last observation I wanna make here before um, turning to questions and discussion is that there are some obvious and quite, I think, terrible consequences of um, what we can think of as the underdevelopment of the US Constitution. I've been working closely um, with Zachary Elkins, a political scientist at the University of Texas, Austin, um, and his colleague, Tom Ginsburg at the University of Chicago. They are the founders of the Comparative Constitutions Project. It is a digital collection of all the constitutions in the world. 
um, we're going to incorporate my amendments, US amendments data into their constitutions project. But we've been trying to do some comparative work. And we've been looking in particular at, for instance, environmental protection amendments. Um, the vast majority of the world's constitutions have provisions for protecting the environment. Um, as you can see here, looking at this blue, this is this blue line here, I think of 196 constitutions, I think it's about 150 of them so far that have environmental protection amendments. We don't have one, as you may know. Um, and this is a trend that you see on the blue line here um, that started uh, at the beginning of um, awareness of climate change and species extinction in the 1960s and then really accelerated around 1970. Um, to 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 uh, where countries all over the world began adopting these environmental protection amendments. In the U.S., we started proposing these amendments. If you look at the red vertical slash marks, those indicate moments when um, environmental protection amendments were introduced in the Congress in the United States. Um, they began in 1967 uh, and were repeatedly introduced. They did not gain enough support to go to the states for ratification. And so the United States is without a constitutional amendment guaranteeing the protection of the environment, the kind of thing um, that is uh, was a, a necessary emendation of constitutions around the world, was a necessary emendation, in my view, of our constitution, um, but was a casualty of widening polarization. So that's really all I wanted to do by way of introducing this project, um, the spirit in which I undertake it of countering polarization by hoping to uh, begin civic-minded conversations about how to change the Constitution. Uh, that, that can include arguments that the Constitution should not be changed. Um, but I think that's an argument that needs to be had. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen um, and invite Jonathan back to join um, a discussion. It's going to be a little bit hard for me to look at the Q&A. Yeah, um, no, I so I've got that, I think, covered. Uh, so you did get some good response to what uh, folks would like to see amended in the Constitution if they could, and then a comment uh, that probably ought to be addressed as well. So uh, let's start with them, or I can give them all to you uh, and see what then rolls in. Uh, but certainly the ERA amend amendment has come up. Uh, it's something that I think we have come within one state of not getting done, including Arizona. Um, at least three people commenting on somehow amending the Constitution to be able to reform our gun laws and, and, and control gun proliferation. Um, the Electoral College is clearly one. Um, let's, let's just start with those three and then I'll kind of move on from there as to what you know you would have to say about any of those. Yeah, no, I think those are all really, um, they're, they're issues that tend to come up quickly and I, I can respond sort of where things are with each of those issues. With the ERA, there are a lot of people who have been fighting for um, the continuation of the ratification process. Some of the ratifications were later rescinded. There are some legal questions involved in whether those rescindings count or whether those states would have to re-ratify. Um, does an amendment gone, that's gone to the states for ratification ever truly expire? Um, so on the one side, there are people that are fighting the fight to sort of gain the ratification of the ERA. Uh, I think there is widespread pub public support for it. But on the other side are people who say that the pledges that the ERA made have actually already been realized through civil rights and other legislation, and that it is it's no longer necessary. Um, there are also some competing equal rights amendments out there. Um, there's one, uh, I think it's called the Equality Amendment. It was proposed by the um, by the feminist legal scholars uh, Kimberly Crenshaw and Catherine McKinnon, um, which is a, a much broader equal rights amendment um, that isn't just eliminating discrimination on the basis of sex. Um, obviously it hasn't gone to Congress. It doesn't, wouldn't have a chance in Congress, um, but that there's been an interesting attempt to suggest that the ERA, which as you may know, 
was first proposed in 1923. Um, women who had fought for the right to vote, which became the 19th Amendment, which was ratified in 1920, believed many women believed that the, um, uh, an urgently necessary next step, which should have been the 20th Amendment, was the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, it was endorsed by both parties in the 1940s. Uh, that it took decades to pass um, Congress in 1972 is kind of one of the great tragedies of American history in the 20th century. Um, and its defeat uh, uh, was the result of a really brilliant political strategy led by um, the conservative activist, Phyllis Schlafly, who founded an organization called Stop ERA. Um, so ERA has a really, really interesting history. And I think there are supporters of equal rights who would now say the Equal Rights Amendment, whose language really does date to 1923, doesn't go anywhere near far enough. And then there were people who would say it's not needed anymore. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a complicated one um, and a really, really interesting question. Um, the other sort of broader question that's raised by the Equal Rights Amendment that I like to make sure to mention is that the Constitution was written by men who believed in a kind of chain of being. They believed that there was a hierarchy of all beings, um, men, women, children, servants, the enslaved, animals. They placed free white men at the top of that hierarchy. Um, women and children were pretty far down um, and everybody else, which in their view would have included uh, people we would now refer to as people of color, indigenous Americans, enslaved Africans, uh, uh, had no part in the political order. So women have no part in the political order established by the constitution. That's why there are no equal rights guaranteed to women because there's no uh, vision that women are part of the polity, um, their dependents like children on men. And so uh, everybody who has been fighting to be recognized by the language of the constitution since its ratification in the 1790s exists and is protected under the constitution in many cases by analogy, right? Like, so there, there are rights that, that women and children have in the, under the constitution that are not specified as being applied to women and children um, or that rights that immigrants have um, that are all have all been political battles. And so the broader argument about say the Equal Rights Amendment is instead of adding yet another amendment to recognize yet another category of people who are not whose rights are not explicitly observed and whose in fact political being is not explicitly contained within the vision of the original constitution, why not just rewrite the constitution? Like it, it is a weakness to be a part of the political order who was never envisioned by the framing document. Um, is, is there a different remedy than just adding amendments is I think, is I think a real question. Um, the, the question of revising the constitution to gain clarity on this, on the second amendment. Um, I don't think there are a lot of people involved in either side of that dispute about the interpretation of the second amendment who are keen to amend the amendment. Um, I think in general, people on either side of the interpretation of the Second Amendment believe they are right and that their interpretation is right. Um, and it is a, it, that is why it has chiefly been a question for the courts um, to, in, to interpret the Second Amendment. The, the thing that is useful to be reminded of with regard to the Second Amendment was is that before the middle of the 1980s, it was pretty much hardly ever cited. It was, it was known as the Lost Amendment. Um, it just, no one ever bothered to use it. It was not understood as guaranteeing an individual right to own a gun, um, nor was that right considered to be a non-existent right, um, but neither was controlling the ownership of guns considered to be outside the bounds of, of the authority of the federal government. Um, the individual rights interpretation of the Second Amendment is a product of, of, of a constitutional revolution of the 1980s of Ronald Reagan's Justice Department. Um, so I think that's that's one where sort of the excavation of the history is, is really important to understanding any, any possible way forward. Um, the Electoral College, when I talk at events like this, people always raise the Electoral College. There's, huge, there's a lot of support for the abolition of the Electoral College. Um, I think generally it is a contortion, again, of the, the Constitution having become unamendable. 
Proposals to abolish the Electoral College date to basically the beginning of the Electoral College. People have been unhappy with the Electoral College for a really long time. Um, it's really just been, there's never been enough political power on the part of the people who are um, disadvantaged by it to abolish it. And when they get power, then they don't want to abolish it. <laughs> so there's a kind of lack of foresight with regard to the Electoral College. And what I um, see most often now are proposals to, um, end the electoral college without recourse to constitutional amendment. Um, so people probably know about the national um, popular vote compact, um, the idea that states could just simply sign a compact saying that they would report to their electoral college delegates, their popular vote totals, and that, all, that we would effectively have a national popular vote if enough states signed the compact. Um, the other way that people have thought about adjusting the um, electoral college and, and the asymmetries that it introduces into our politics, um, some of which were intended, but most of which at this point are just freaks of geography and never envisioned by the people who came up with the idea for the electoral college, um, is to increase the number of representatives in the house, um, which hasn't been done for decades and decades for nearly a century. It's been 435 members. Um, if it were a thousand members, uh, we'd have many more delegates to the Electoral College and it would be a, would be closer to a popular vote, which I think is a kind of an ingenious end run around amendment, but an, 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 an interesting one. Um, so those are the three that I heard you mention, Jonathan, the ERA, um, the Second Amendment and um, the Electoral College. Yeah, and those, those are kind of issues that people raise that are certainly um, subject to potential constitutional or other remedies. There's another batch that has come in that are that are much more related to structural, and I'd like to hear your view on those. I think we'd like to hear your view on those in relation to the Constitution. That's the structure of the United States Senate and the structure of the Supreme Court. With regard to the structure of the Supreme Court, uh, you know, the question is, can we and does it make sense to add more justices and how should that be done uh, to, you know, make progress on, on some of where we sit, and also the idea of uh, term limits for Supreme Court justices. Mm -hmm. uh, likewise, on the United States Senate, uh, suggestions have been made here this evening with regard to term limits on senators, and also uh, perhaps, and I don't know if this is even possible under the Constitution, uh, make it so that it's not two senators per state, but it's almost more of a unicameral system where mm -hmm. you have uh, senators more based on population. Maybe that's your suggestion with regard to the House. Uh, but so, yes, yeah, structure of the United States Senate and structure of the Supreme Court. Could that help get us to a place where we're mm -hmm. not just literally uh, two ends of a pole? Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are those are both great questions, and I, I think one thing that would among the, my motivations for this project is I, the fact that people have been trying to do these things for centuries is not a history that is visible to Americans. Um, but attempts to reshape the Supreme Court, to impose term limits on members of Congress, um, and to restructure the Senate, proposals to do that have been made on the floor of Congress since you know 1794. Um, I wish I had worked my data to such a way I could throw up a slide to show you like how many times people have proposed term limits. Um, because I think it would empower people, like it, it may be that we shouldn't have term limits, but it, it seems important to know that, that people have been proposing that for a long time and fighting for that for a long time. Um, I, I think that uh, there's, a, there's a, a whole lot of logic behind term limits. Um, there are state constitutions that have term limits. Um, if you look at constitutions around the world, term limits are very natural. Of course, these things are possible and we know they're possible because the presidency did not have term limits in the constitution, it now does, right? We did pass an amendment that instituted term limits on the presidency. There's no reason that we couldn't do that for Congress or for the Supreme Court. In a way, it's like that happened so long ago that most Americans don't remember <laughs> that there didn't used to be term limits for the presidency. Um, so I think it's important to remember there didn't used to be term limits for the office of the president, and now there are because people thought it would be a good idea and they succeeded in making this change. And it, in fact, I think was a good idea. I don't think there's a groundswell of opposition um, to having an extension, an extended term. 
Um, there are some presidents that maybe would like to stay in office longer than they did, or some of their um, supporters might wish that they did. Um, there have been some quite interesting proposals um, made. One very frequent proposal made about the presidency was for it to be a finite six-year term, so that there wouldn't even be the interruption of re-election, that effectively a president doesn't rule for more than six years, and it would be healthier to have a president actually do the job for six years instead of campaigning for most of um, the middle the middle of those years and then undergoing the transition and the country undergoing the transition. I think that's an interesting idea. Um, with regard to the Senate, remember, um, the people didn't used to elect the senators. Direct election of the Senate was a reform. It was a constitutional amendment that was passed about a century ago by progress by as a, during an era of good government reform, where populists said, you know what, just because the framers didn't trust the people to, to elect the Senate, we think now that the people should elect the Senate. And they won that and they uh, made an amendment that, that, that was responsible for the direct election of, of the Senate. So I guess just to sort of make sure, <clears throat> I, you know, my students don't know these things. So I'm not like, I'm trying to be condescending, but just say like, remember, <laughs> like what you think has always been there and must be part of the constitutional order is often the consequence of an amendment, of a, of a hard fought political change. Um, I'm, uh, uh, so similarly with the, the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court, the constitution doesn't say how many people member, how many uh, Supreme Court justices there have to be. That's a, that's a legislative matter that, that you, it doesn't require a constitutional amendment to change that. Um, it has been changed many times. Um, it's not, it's not easy to change. There's a lot of objection to it, um, but it's been changed many times. And uh, I think whether imposing term limits on the Supreme Court is the right solution or changing the number of Supreme Court justices is the right solution, these are interesting questions. There was some really fantastic testimony at, on to, this summer at a president's commission on what to do about the Supreme Court. Um, it, it's a bit of a stuck place given that <clears throat> Polarization means Congress is never going to actually agree on what to do about the Supreme Court and it has to happen in Congress. Um, I guess I would just suggest, though, um, just to sort of poke at people a little bit. Um, these are changes that are really um, tinkering around the edges. Um, not that it wouldn't be transformative to have congressional term limits. Um, is how much would it really change? It would it would help with um, money and politics questions, right? Because people would at least know they're serving a certain amount of time. Um, it would uh, help reduce the influence of special interests, I suppose. But it's not going to change everything. Um, so I sometimes throw out this idea, and if I knew how to use polling on um, on Zoom, I would put this in a poll. But if someone who has access to the polling feature wants to put this in poll. I'm curious, I'd be curious to see how this would go down as a vote. We could do some votes. I just can't do that. I can't do it while also looking at the screen. Um, you know, the idea that um, Congress is, should uh, be a certain number of people that represent a certain percentage of the popula population, we have proportionate representation in Congress. That is, we have one member of Congress for every X number of people. Um, that was a new idea in 1787. The idea that the people should be numerically represented as, in, as a matter of mathematical proportion um, was new. It was because demography was new. The ability to count people accurately was new. The United States was the first nation to require a, a decanal census. Um, we have the census in the constitution because we have a mathematical democracy. We, we, we have to count the people every 10 years in order um, to figure out how many members of Congress you have. Um, there were other ideas at the time um, under the Articles of Confederation that the Constitution uh, was a replacement for that really just the, the states were represented. Um, the people weren't represented. Um, there was, as, as you know, the big compromise, the big moral failing of the Constitutional Convention was deciding um, the Northerners agreeing with Southerners that enslaved people should be counted for purposes of representation as three fifths of a person. Um, this fraction is, is, is another piece of the math on which the country is founded. Um, maybe that idea has run its course. Like what if, for instance, so here's my kind of polling question. What if uh, someone proposed establishing the third branch of the legislature where representation would be 
inversely proportionate to the greenhouse gas emissions of a district. Um, where you would break down polarization. Um, rural places do really well. Uh, they get a lot of representation. A lot of liberal bastions would do really badly, um, you know, polluting cities. Um, if you, you can look it up on Wikipedia, you can see the order of the states by their, by, by their, their carbon emissions. Um, it's very interesting, just really not a red state, blue state thing, um, but it'd be a big, big, big incentive for states um, because they would get political, they would enhance their political voice to reduce their carbon emissions. Um, so when I say like, why not think big about what is the society we really need in the 21st century? Um, that's the kind of idea that I'm keen to have people throw out. Um, because when you think about, because we have a lot of veneration for the framers of the constitution who you know, as a historian, I have less of that because the or just other like anybody else I study. Um, I'm fascinated by the by a lot of those guys, um, but uh, they came up with some pretty good ideas. Don't we have any good ideas? I don't know. That's my one good idea, is that third branch. I think it's a good idea. Well, that's definitely a different structure. So we've talked, <laughs> we, we've talked a little bit about issues. We've talked a little bit about structure. Now we've got, and I'm grouping these questions. We've got so many and there's only so much time. Um, so now I'm going to go a little bit to methodology, um, which are the questions have come in first. What do you think is the most feasible route towards any amendment to the constitution? Or is it really just having five uh, justices who are willing to be much more active, uh, but if there's a different feasible route. And second, what is different now, uh, maybe other than polarization, th th that we can't get amendments where there was a time where it seemed like people mm -hmm. were willing to amend the constitution if a good idea came along. So those are the two questions. What's the most feasible route to start to be able to make these changes because there's a lot of good ideas and mm -hmm. second uh what's different now mm -hmm. so um there's a really great article by my colleague at the harvard law school vicky jackson called the myth of the unamendability of the constitution in which and i would recommend you look at it she she looks at this this empirical research that has been done this guy donald lutz looked at all the constitutions in the world and figured out their rate of amendment um, just as a mathematical rate. And he's the guy who sort of figured out that the US is the least amendable constitution. Um, and so Vicki Jackson was like, but why? <laughs> like, it's not an insurmount, like, yes, well, there's the two thirds and the three quarters, like it's a high bar, but it, it's not that hard. Um, and she conducted an investigation in which she concluded that um, the constitution is just, is not, um, some constitutions have problems with amendability because the number of veto players, like there's just like a lot of like structural obstacles. We don't actually have that. Yes, it's a high bar. Her argument is it's the culture of venerating the constitution, which doesn't exist in the states. You know, if you live in Minnesota and there's a proposal to amend the constitution in the state of Minnesota, people are like, yeah, okay, is it a good idea or not? Like they don't say like, but wait, you know, Sleepy Joe Franco wrote the constant was one of the drafters in the last version in 1892, and I, he was a deity. Like they just people don't worship the framers of the state constitutions. They don't even know who they are. They're just some guys who wrote the constitution at some point, um, and they have a sense of, of some sort of ownership in the state constitution. Like there could be something that should be fixed here, because the rate of amendability in U.S. state constitutions is about the same as like the average of constitutions around the world. So, and those have very high bars as well. Like, it's not like, it's not technically easy to amend state constitution, but people do it. So her conclusion was the obstacle to amending the US constitution is veneration. Um, it's the cult around the constitution, the culture of veneration that it, it, it has been useful politically at certain points for certain people to insist on the near deity, the, the, the near divine quality of, of, the, of James Madison say. And it, it served some people a short-term political gain, but it's actually a huge negative consequence for the whole of the political culture. So that's why I throw up my, like, I call it the tree branch, the third branch of government um, idea to just say, 
you know, it doesn't have to be this. <laughs> like, not that constitutional stability hasn't been really important for the stability of the country, but like, we could think a little bit. So I'm just trying to deflate the veneration. Um, with all due respect, it's a great constitution in many ways. It was deeply flawed and we could do better. Um, so I think the single most important thing to do is educative um, around, and that's why, that, at least for me, is justifying my own work. But um, with regard to uh, the second part was how would you actually proceed with, with getting um, an amendment through you know, it's it's interesting. The 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 one of the things I'm trying to look at empirically with this data is what are the conditions under which things do actually make it even to the floor, and does the number of times something gets introduced mean that it ends up coming to a vote, or are people just standing up there and saying, "I think we need," you know, just it's a camera moment at this point. Um, and that has to lend itself to some investigation. Like I have to, I have to look at that. There's a lot of things, um, and I don't wouldn't say like these are not a lot of the changes I'm looking at in this body of evidence are terrible. So, for instance, one thing I was really surprised to see, and I'd never seen anybody write about. So, um, the Fifteenth Amendment was ratified in 1870. The Fifteenth Amendment granted um, Black freedmen the right to vote, guaranteed them the right to vote. It was not honored, of course. That's why we needed the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Um, but it was, a, it was a reconstruction amendment um, that guaranteed the right to vote um, to black men. Pretty much in every congressional session after 1871 down to I think 1923, an amendment was proposed repealing the 15th amendment. They were all from Jim Crow's Southern, you know, former Confederate states. Um, it comes up every session. It's like these guys are just taking turns, making a speech calling for, um, the, the repeal of the 15th amendment, which is really interesting in the sense of like, why do they even bother? Like they've already instituted Jim Crow, like nobody can effectively vote in, in their states anyway at this point. Um, there's something else that they are gaining politically by making the speech on behalf of repeal. Um, so there are dynamics to the process that I think bear some scrutiny and might tell us about what works and, and, and what does doesn't work and when things work and, and when things don't work. Well, and so speaking then of, now I'm going to start moving to the contrarians because they're the most fun anyway in the questions, is um, speaking about, you know, the feasibility and two, two questions. One, does constitutional history even matter anymore? Uh, number one. And number two, what is is there an upside to not amending a constitution? Remember you're in Arizona this evening, the home of Andy Biggs and Paul, Paul Gosar. And if you got a wrong, you know, you know, is, are there, is there an upside to that stability? Uh, and I, I think we all understand yeah. the downside, but, but yeah, those are the two yeah. questions. Is constitution yeah. history yeah. anymore and the upside of the stability and not amending? So, um, I hope constitutional history matters. I think it is generally not taught. Um, I think uh, American historians really stopped being interested in the constitution a few decades ago. So there's quite an impoverished scholarship on the constitution. Um, uh, I, I think it matters all the time. Um, think about the historians called to testify during two of Trump's, uh, two attempts to impeach Donald Trump. Um, to try to interpret uh, high crimes and misdemeanors um, for uh, House and Senate members um, that mattered. Um, did it make the difference? No, but did it matter? Yes. Um, I'm sorry, Jonathan, I feel like I've forgotten the second. The second question was the the positive side of stability. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I'm not going to drive the positive side of stability. But one of the things I, I think is really interesting. So there was a movement. The last big um, push from the right for a constitutional amendment was for a balanced budget amendment. It was really popular supply side economists during you know Reaganomics era, guys in the 80s, was proposed again and again and again and again and again. It seemed quite promising. It had a huge amount of support, um, a huge amount of opposition. But the, 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 the era that begins to, 
in our present day with unamendability really is the failure of the ERA and the failure of the balanced budget amendment, both which had a lot of support. Um, I, I wouldn't have favored the balanced budget amendment myself. Like I would think it was kind of a bad idea. Um, but as a response to that failure, a number of um, policymakers on the right, not necessarily conservatives, this was before the Republican party had become um, so wholly conservative, a number of people in the Republican Party began uh, calling for a constitutional convention, um, which is another way that you can revise the constitution it's provided for. We have never had one. States have them, not infrequently, but um, we have not had one. Um, and the opposition to the idea of holding a constitutional convention came largely from the left. And the left, the left sphere, and generally the opposition to constitutional change of this fashion, which requires popular participation, comes from the left, which prefers going to the court. Um, and, in, and it fears, and the way that this had been framed at the time, the fear was of a runaway convention. That if a convention, constitutional convention was called and delegates elected from the states and people got together somewhere and that they were charged with or convened for the purpose of voting on say a slate of like three or four amendments, that the convention could, be, could run away and essentially decide, as actually is what, is what happened at Philadelphia, they could just decide to write a whole new system of government. And progressives, then liberals, um, liberals feared um, and said as much frequently um, that at a um, you know, truly democratic, popularly representative constitutional convention, civil rights would basically be abolished. And, and civil rights and civil liberties, um, not necessarily civil rights in terms of like classic um, uh, rights to prohibit discrimination by race, but, but all manner of civil rights um, would be abolished, um, which is an interesting fear. <laughs> like it's, it's a fear of democracy, right? Um, and so people are sort of loath to suggest that, but that, but that the counter-majoritarian work of seeking rights by going to the courts has been when the legislature was part of um, the, 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 the work of political tyranny that was denying rights to minority groups. Um, uh, you know, that, that, it, that it was necessary to go to the courts um, for marriage equality, for same-sex marriage. It was necessary to go to the courts um, for abortion rights, it was necessary to go to the courts in Brown v. Board for um, for for the for uh, an end of segregation, segregated schools. Um, that these were things that had these were these are rights that have been secured through constitutional interpretation sought from the Supreme Court and could be uh, pulled back by a constitutional convention. That's you know that the the sort of movement for a constitutional convention really floundered on on that point. Um, I'm not sure it, it, it was it was a it was kind of a real it was talked about a lot in the 80s and especially in the 90s. The law school here um, had a huge conference, must have been maybe like 92, called Con Con Con, the Constitutional Convention Conference. <laughs> and like everybody who had a position on whether there should be a new constitutional convention came and it was a, apparently this uproarious rowdy argument. Um, I, I honestly don't even know what I think about. I, I have my students deliberate the question, should we have a new constitutional convention? Um, they, they read arguments on either side. Um, that would be a handy way to do it in terms of like getting it done. Um, but if you, don't, if you don't believe the people are just, then you can't do that. Yeah, I think I've got about two more set time for two more sets of questions and we won't get to all the questions but trying to group them together as best I can um, and this goes really well first of all it, it, it appears to some that the real problem isn't necessarily with the constitution of the supreme court but more with the political parties who make up that who then appoint that Supreme Court by winning the elections. Mm -hmm. uh, should we be folk, one, should we be focusing more on reforming either our election system or uh, our political parties? 
-hmm. and how would we go about that? Second, apparently veneration, which was a word that a couple of people have grabbed on tonight, was less strong uh, during the time when amendment was possible. And if partisan polarization is one of the principal impediments to that, what do we do about what do we mm -hmm. do about partisan polarization? So really, political parties and yeah, and the partisan. So yeah, and I don't I don't mean to um, deny difference of opinion, but I agree with all of your contrarians and dissenters and <laughs> um, there's a lot that's really bad, <laughs> and a lot of things. Um, that if I were devoting my energies as a citizen to trying to remedy, um, did, yeah, I would say looking at it, like, it's kind of a waste of time to be fighting for a constitutional amendment. It's not going to happen. Like, meanwhile, we have to have safe and secure, free and safe and secure elections. We, we, you know, we have massive problems with money, money in elections. Um, we have a, we have built a polarization machine that corporations have built polarization machines that they make huge amounts of money off of. That we are trapped in and we have to break down we have to break those machines before anything else can possibly be fixed um so i have a long list of stuff that really needs to get fixed before i would come to this i am not taking this project on as like i am joe citizen campaigning for constitutional amendment i'm taking this project on as a historian who believes that our understanding of the possibilities of constitutional change have been impoverished by having a poor sense of the history of efforts to change the constitution. And that a contribution I can make as a scholar who likes to work in archives, and work with evidence and tell stories from evidence to say, look, 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 this is, this is way more flexible than you think. Uh, we need to be, because I don't think uh, among the many stressors of a nation. We just had an attempt. We had an armed insurrection at our capital during the certification of a presidential election. That is as close to civil war as a country has come since 1860. That is to be taken very, 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 very seriously. So it behooves everybody who cares about the health of your community, the, the future of your children, the liberal democratic experiment, the country as a place to think about possible solutions to our political disagreements that fall short of political violence. And that doesn't mean crazy political compromise. But for me, one place it seems like place to dig at, do some work, feel like I'm making a contribution as a scholar, have conversations like this is to say, stop venerating the constitution and think about what community of what polity you believe in is good for the human condition. That was a question in the 18th century. They answered it one way. We have a different answer now. I think we need to have that conversation. So last set of questions, although then I'm gonna uh, throw one that has almost probably nothing to do uh, with what we've been talking tonight, but uh, is, uh, and I think these two go together. Um, one of the uh, people has commented, one of the participants has commented, do you think that when we see a demographic change in this country that seems to be happening, do you think that's going to help make for more flexibility in, in, in change? And then one of the other uh, comments with regard to structure was, should we have cultural representation? That's an idea I haven't heard much. So, you know, but I think they'd go together, you know, will the demographic change make for more flexibility and how do you deal with cultural representation, which is a big issue these days. Mm -hmm. So one thing I didn't talk about when we looked at those charts at the very outset, and I, we saw, um, income inequality and political polarization begin, which had been quite flat from say 1945 to about 1965, we saw them begin to rise around 68 and, and both been continually rising. So if we think about the problem of political polarization. Is it a problem uh, from 1968 to now? So now we have this narrow window to think about analytically. A couple things to say about that. Before 1965, most black people in this country could not vote. They were beaten literally beaten back from polling places. So 
does it matter that there was low polarization before? It was suppressed, you know, like 15% of the electorate. Like, how is that a political success, right? So we, maybe we shouldn't think so, like that such a, was such a great period, right? So now we have, okay, we have much more fully enfranchised electorate. That's great. Well, people are gonna disagree more. <laughs> it's like, a di and then the other thing that happened in 1965 is the, the sort of the, the crucial piece of Lyndon Johnson's civil rights agenda was the Immigration Act of 1965. And if you look at the percentage of um, Americans who are of foreign birth, so immigrants who become American citizens or people who come to the United States are not yet citizens of green cards or um, from 1965 to the present, it is a constantly rising figure. Um, and it's people from all over the world because the 1965 Immigration Act abolished the 1924 National Origins Act, which said, you know, these X number of people from this country or from that country, it was this whole eugenicist craziness. In 1965, it was like, you can come from anywhere if you have a good reason to be here, especially if you have family here. So immigration, especially from um, Asia, um, parts of Africa and the Caribbean, like just a much, a much different um, immigration policy really changed um, the nature of the electorate. Um, that combined with the Voting Rights Act um, means that, sure, we have a more burly, rowdy, fractious politics. I would rather, me, I would rather that country, in spite of the problems of polarization, to the country where there's not a lot of polarization, but people are unable to vote because of the color of their skin. Like you don't, you don't like celebrate that, right? Like if, this is a cost. If, if, if it's very hard to have a fully multi-racial, multi-ethnic democracy. It, 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 it's something that the United States tried after the Civil War and Reconstruction and in this kind of really incredible vision um, that was then abandoned, wholly abandoned and betrayed. Um, there needs to be a vision for that now. Um, I think that there is a vision for it, but what's happened in the interim is that people who have been so distressed by that demographic change um, and the backlash against it have together at the political extremes very slowly dismantled the liberal and civic institutions that make that democracy possible. So we now have this, you know, wonderfully exciting, um, enriched cultural range and of community um, and institutions that haven't been thriving and haven't supported that um, and have been used um, in opposition to that. So th it is a moment for real reinvention. I don't, I don't, I am not persuaded by the call for some sort of cultural representation. We, I believe, I believe we are a polity as a people. Um, we are, I believe anybody who believes in the idea of this country belongs in this country. Um, and then we decide together what the idea of this country is, but we have to implement it together. Um, I, I think that's possible, but I, I think there's a lot of institutional decay that is interfering with realizing, I think the real incredible promise still of that vision. Okay. I think, I, I, I don't wanna really end it on random, but I got this first question, which is totally uh, nowhere. That'll bring us down from that incredibly inspirational last answer. Are you a friend of Heather Cox Richardson? Do you even know who she is? <laughs> I don't know Heather Cox. I mean, I know who Heather Cox Richardson is. Yeah, okay. but I don't. We don't, we don't if we, I'm sure we've met in some historian circles, um, but, but no, okay. I don't. Well, there you go. Uh, Dr. Lepore, I want to thank you for a, a really stimulating evening. It was wonderful to have you. Um, we have a great audience here and I know they appreciated you. So I, I wanna give you that thanks again to the audience very quickly. Uh, I, would add, I would suggest to you that on Thursday, January 27th, we have Liliana Mason. I, I'm sure Dr. Lepore is familiar with her work. She's a professor at the University of Maryland. Her most recent book, if you wanna read in advance is called Uncivil Agreement, How Politics Became Our Identity. And her work is really taking political science research, behavioral research on partisan identity, partisan bias, social story, American social polarization, and kind of telling us where we 
we are now. So uh, uh, a really more of a uh, um, uh, trying to be fact-based as we all are as to where we are today. But again, uh, so I wanna thank everybody for joining. Dr. Lepore, again, thank you for being just a great addition to our list of great speakers we've had. We're, we're working our hardest here in Tucson to, to reduce that polarization. And we're in, of course, as you know, a, a tough state. And uh, so we really like hearing directly from folks who've done significant work. And so to everybody, uh, Good evening and uh, have a great night. And thank you again, Jim. Thanks.